hello, welcome to my channel. My name is Adrian and today we are going to determine the coefficient of performance for the ideal refrigeration cycle. Let's get started. For this problem, we are considering an refrigeration cycle that uses R134A as the working fluid and the temperature of the refrigerant in the evaporator is minus 20 degrees Celsius and in the condenser it is 40 degrees Celsius and the refrigerant is circulated at a rate of 0.03 kilograms per second. And now, like I said, we need to go and determine the coefficient of performance as well as the capacity of the plant in rate of refrigeration. And you can see here is a diagram of the example where we start off at point one when the refrigerant leaves the evaporator so at minus 20 degrees Celsius, the compressor does, does some work on the refrigerant working fluid. It gets compressed to a higher pressure to 0.2 and then it enters the condenser where some heat is extracted and it is throttled over an expansion valve and we end up back just before the evaporator at a very low pressure. Here is a diagram, a temperature entropy diagram. And if you look at it, it looks really similar to the Rankine cycle where we use steam to generate power. But in this case, it is in reverse. It is anti-clockwise where it starts off as a saturated vapor. It gets compressed and it's a superheated, it's not really superheated steam or it's rather superheated working fluid in a sense at a compressed pressure line here to two dash and three and then it goes through the condenser ends up at point three it is throttled over the expansion valve and we end up at point four dash and it starts all over again we are going to use pyromat to access the thermodynamic tables for our 134a refrigerant fluid so first thing first we need to go and we need to import Pyromat and I'm going to set my unit pressure and default pressure to kilopascal and 100 kilopascal and then I'm going to assign the tables for my refrigerant to a variable called MP which is multiphase underscore R13A4A. Now the values given to us is the mass flow of the refrigerant is 0.03 that is in kilograms per second and then the temperature at 0.1 as well as the temperature at 0.3. You can see I've added 273.15 to both values of temperature because we are working in the units Kelvin and not in degrees Celsius. So we need to convert that from degrees Celsius to Kelvin. So the first point that we're going to consider is 0.1. That is just after the compressor and we are going to calculate enthalpy at 0.1. And because it is because it's on the saturated vapor side of the curve there at point one, we know that the quantity of the refrigerant is X equals one. So we can say that enthalpy at point one is a saturated vapor. So we use HS, meaning that it is enthalpy on the saturation line and we are using element or we want element one, which is the saturated vapor. Element zero is saturated liquid. We do not want that, we want saturated vapor. The same goes for entropy. We calculate entropy on the saturation line and we want element one, which is saturated vapor. Also, we can go and get the pressure at which it is pressurized. So it is pressurized at a temperature T3. We know at point three, we know the temperature and the temperature line is constant for 0.2, two dash and three. So we can use the value that we know at point three to cut to determine what the pressure is. And we use again pressure on the saturation line. Here we don't need to specify an element in block brackets because the pressure is the same if it is saturated liquid or if it's saturated vapor, it's the same thing. So then we can solve this cell and we get the enthalpy after the evaporator as 386.6 kilojoules per kilogram. The entropy is 1.7413 kilojoules per kilogram and the vapor pressure is 1017.2. Uh, this needs to be kilopascal. So the vapor pressure is just above one megapascal. Next, we can 
consider the point after the compressor that is point two and for the ideal cycle entropy before and after the compressor is the same so that is why we can say s2 entropy at point two is equal to the entropy at point one and now we can go and we can calculate the temperature at point two as a function of entropy so we can use this t underscore s function of pyromat and we give it the entropy at point two as well as the pressure that we've calculated of the compressed gas and then we can get the temperature at point two. We can also get the enthalpy at point two by feeding it the temperature at point two and the pressure at point two. And then lastly, because we know the values of the enthalpy before and after the compressor, we can go and calculate the work required by the compressor to elevate the pressure of the refrigerant to just above a megapascal. And if we run the cell, we get the values for enthalpy and temperature, and we can see the work required or done by the compressor is 42.5 kilojoules per kilogram. And now we can consider the points before and after the throttling valve. So now again, if we go back to the curve, we are at point three, which is on the saturated liquid side of our TS diagram. So we can use the fact that we know that to determine all its properties. So the enthalpy at point three, we can again use the enthalpy value on the saturation line and we can give it the pressure of the refrigerant and this time we want element zero the first element which is the saturated liquid value similarly for the entropy at point three we get the entropy on the saturation line for a given pressure and we want the first element element zero which is the saturated liquid value for entropy at this given pressure we also know that the enthalpy before and after the expansion valve is the same for this ideal cycle. And now that we've got all these values, we can calculate the heat that was added to the refrigerant through the evaporator by just calculating the difference between the enthalpy values before and after the evaporator. So that is the enthalpy at point one minus the enthalpy value at point four. And we can run the cell and we can see that the heat added by the evaporator is 130.1 kilojoules per kilogram. And we now have everything we need to determine the coefficient of performance, the COP of the refrigeration cycle can be calculated through the heat added on the low pressure side of the cycle divided by the work required by the compressor. And we can note the COP as beta. So if we run this cell, we can see that the coefficient of performance is 3.063 and the refrigeration capacity is 3.904 kilowatt. But that's not it. We can also use this system as a heat pump. So for the in for in the case of a heat pump, we want to add heat to a system. If you want to warm up your house, then you would want to use this as adding heat to an environment. So then we can actually go and say that our coefficient of performance beta, in this case now is beta dash, is the heat ex um, or the heat ejected by the condenser divided by the work required by the compressor. And this Q subscript H is the difference in enthalpy at point two and point three. So if we run this cell, we can see that the heat ejected by the condenser is 172.6 kilojoules per kilogram. And then we can get calculate the COP again, and we can get a value of 4.063. And that is how you go about calculating the coefficient of performance for a refrigeration cycle or for a heat pump if you are interested in knowing what the COP is of your heat pump cycle. Next up, we are going to have a look at an actual refrigeration cycle, because obviously this is an ideal cycle, so you won't really see this in real life. In actual cycles, there is efficiency, losses, etc. to the system. So you'll have to take that into consideration. If you've liked this video and you feel all heated up by all this math and not refrigerated by, by it all, Give it a thumbs up if you want to see similar content like this. Do consider subscribing. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video. Bye.